What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Bug of the Week. This week on our journey through all of the insect orders, we have arrived at stoneflies, also known as Plecoptera. So, first of all, with their name, Plecoptera, it comes from the Greek words pleco and terra. Pleco meaning folded and terra meaning wing, so folded wings. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But first, let's get some of the general information out of the way. First of all, this order consists of about 3,400 species worldwide so far within about 10 different families. You can find these all over the world. I think you'll have the most luck finding these insects around freshwater ecosystems, especially fast-moving streams, creeks, rivers, things like that. They definitely like moving water because, spoiler alert, their nymphs are aquatic and they like really oxygen-rich water. So, firstly, starting off with their anatomy. Adult stoneflies are really unique looking. They have these two sets of very veiny, smoky colored, dark, membranous wings. One unique thing about their wings is that the hind pair is actually larger than the forewings, which is quite unusual. Usually, it's the other way around, where the forewings are larger than the hind wings, but this is kind of one of their more quirky factors about them. Stoneflies also feature long antennae and cerci. I would say this is a very good example of red-like antennae as well. A lot of the antennae we've talked about so far on the series have been bead-like or segmented, but these have long thread-like antennae. Oftentimes, if you catch one of these stoneflies, you won't see the cerci unless you turn them over. Then you'll see the cerci because the cerci are often covered by their wings. Another noticeable factor about these guys is their eyes. They're quite far apart and are sort of beady, circular eyes. Lastly, their mouth parts. Their chewing, chewing, biting mouth parts are quite prominent, although it's not always true, but oftentimes the adults don't eat anything in that stage. Lastly, I would say just kind of overall, the stone Stoneflies have sort of a flattened, you know, streamlined appearance. And that's what I kind of want to talk about about these guys is the ability to fold their wings. This isn't something that we've seen really much at all. It, you know, we talked about Dermaptera last week. They're kind of an exception to a lot of the rules with wings. You know, they have very weird, unusual wings. So I figured stoneflies are a good place to start to talk about this ability that insects, that a lot of insects have to fold their wings over each other. So this term is what we entomologists call neoptery. So neoptery is the ability for insects to fold their wings over each other and kind of tuck them away when they're not using them. This is called pleating, you know, wing pleating. And although this might not seem very interesting or special at first, it's actually one of the ways that us entomologists think that insects became so successful. So if you remember with some of the winged insects we've talked about already, like the dragonflies and the mayflies, when they land, their wings are out. They're either up straight, they're either or they're, they're spread out flat. But starting with the stoneflies, well, really starting with the dermaptera, but it's a different thing. Starting with these insects and so on, you start to see the insects tuck their wings away, fold them away in some form when they land. And if you think about it, this is actually super important and super beneficial for insects as a whole. So if they are to land and they keep their wings out, that's a lot of surface area for predators to grab onto. So if you're thinking about, you know, how to evade predators the best, leaving your wings out is not a good way to do that. So when you land, if you're able to fold your wings up, that is a huge advantage. And that's why we see it persist in the rest of the insects moving forward. So Neoptery is thought to be one of the most important developments in insects that made them as successful as, as they have been. Another really important aspect is it opened up all these different ecological niches. If you think about you know, an insect landing, they're very bulky, right? And that not only makes it easier for predators to grab them, but it also makes them, you know, not fit in small places very well. And so if you think about an insect being able to fold its wings, it is now able to fit in very small areas, in tunnels or under leaves or into a, a beehive or things like that that they wouldn't have been able to do before. I mean, it's it's like it's like those videos of those fighter jets that are able to fold their wings inwards to fit into the hangar, right? If they're not able to do that, they wouldn't be able to fit as many planes in the hangar. So that's sort of how we think about this with insects. Considering all of these places that you will find winged insects, they wouldn't be able to live there if they had to hold their wings out 
straight. But yeah, anyway, Neoptery, super important in the history of the insects. And I figured stoneflies were a good place to talk about that with. So moving on to the life history of the stoneflies. So these insects have a hemimetabolist development that we've been talking about throughout the series so far, meaning they have a three-stage incomplete metamorphosis. So egg to nymph to adult. So we've talked about the adults. Let's move on to the nymphs, the immatures. In this case, we call them naiads, like I've said, because these nymphs live in the water. They're aquatic. They live in freshwater ecosystems. So we call them naiads. So you might be thinking, Brayden, how do you tell these apart from all the other naiads we've talked about? And I would say the main thing to look for kind of across the board is the gills. So with the stoneflies, their gills are little tiny kind of tufts of hair behind the head, at the base of the legs or at the end of the abdomen. So they look kind of like hairy armpits. I mean, that's that's how I would describe them. Whereas, you know, the other ones we've talked about, like the mayflies and the dragonflies, the mayflies have little feather-like gills that come off the, the, the sides of the abdomen. And then dragonflies have gills that come off the end of the abdomen. So basically look at the gills. That tells you a lot. Also, the naiads here also have long thread-like antennae and long cerci just like the adults do. Both of those in combination with the unique gills, that'll tell you that this is a stonefly. So these nymphs live in, like I said, freshwater ecosystems, and they really like flowing water. They like oxygenated water. And while they are in the nymph stage, they feed on algae, detritus, decaying plant matter, and some are even carnivorous, feeding on small freshwater invertebrates, like other small larvae, other small insects in the water. Now, these insects are very, very sensitive to water quality. So if you see stonefly nymphs in a stream or around a stream, that likely means the water is very, very clean. Because if something happens to your freshwater ecosystem, stoneflies are basically the first thing to go. So they're a really good indicator species of water health. Okay, so once these insects have gone through a series of molts, they will then leave the water and molt into their final adult stage, sprouting wings and only living for about a week or two in this adult stage. But while in this adult stage, they will often do a very interesting behavior called skimming. So the adults will fly over the water stream and they'll dive down and, you know, skim off the water, almost like a skipping stone. And what's happening here is they're not actually hunting, they're not attracting mates. It's actually just for locomotion. So stoneflies are not very good flyers comparatively to some of the other flying insects. And so what they'll do is they'll they'll do this skimming behavior, almost like a trampoline to, you know, gain altitude again and sort of keep the longevity of their flight without using as much energy. It's almost when you see a large bird gliding, you see it especially with seabirds, they'll use the wind off of the water to you know, give them a boost upwards. The stoneflies are doing the same thing here. They're bouncing off the water and taking the air that bounces off the water with them. And so they're able to conserve more energy, flap their wings less, and it's thought to be an early sign of the evolution of flight in insects. And so it's thought to be a very ancestral trait. Another really, really cool thing about the Plecopterans is they're actually very cold tolerance. So up in the north, in the more snowy seasons, these insects will actually emerge in the middle of the winter, which is super weird, super unusual. And so the adults will emerge out of like icy water, like super cold water that insects don't typically survive in. And you'll see adults in the middle of the winter with snow on the ground crawling through the snow, which is super unusual. First of all, how are they able to do this? And second of all, why do they do this? They're able to do this because certain species have the ability to produce an almost antifreeze-like protein in their hemolymph. So hemolymph is like the analogous version of blood for insects. So insects don't have actual blood like humans do. They have something that's sort of a, a liquid-like thing called hemolymph that sort of sloshes around in their body cavity so they don't have veins. If you want me to talk about like the circulatory system and more anatomy of the insect later on, I can make another video about that. But anyways, they basically have this antifreeze-like protein in their blood-like material, which keeps their insides from freezing. And so they're able to withstand, you know, sub-zero temperatures and seem completely 
unbothered. And in some species, they even seem to prefer this condition because there's way less predators. So, you know, if they're only alive as adults for one to two weeks, this is a huge advantage. Way less predators to distract them. Uh, you know, they're just trying to find a mate. And so if they don't have as many predators out there as they would in the summertime, if it works, doing it in the winter is a huge advantage. And I'll try to mention them as we go through our insect orders. But certain members of certain orders are able and specialized to withstand this specific niche, which is the winter time, which most insects do not try and exploit. Most of them emerge in the spring or the summer and don't even bother with the cold winter months. But if you think about it, this is a huge niche that isn't even being tapped into by other insects. So this is a really effective strategy for some insects, Plecopter being one of them, and a really weird order, which this is their entire thing. This is like the thing that they do, which we'll get to in a couple of weeks. I'm excited for that one. I say this every week, but I think stoneflies are super cool, super interesting, and a great example of, you know, certain niches that were made available to them that they have exploited, they've taken advantage of, and it's obviously worked really well for them. With that, I hope you all enjoyed this episode, Bug of the Week. Next week, we are talking about Orthoptera, which are the grasshoppers, crickets, and Katie did, and you do not want to miss that one. That's going to be super fun. I hope you all enjoyed this episode. If you did, leave a like, subscribe, leave a comment if I missed something or maybe your favorite stonefly fact. But with that, I will see you all next week. But until then, keep on bugging. Peace. <laughs>